Our next speaker hails originally from Eastern Michigan. While studying for an advanced degree at Eastern Michigan University in 1971, he responded to a left-wing professor's protest about an appearance on the campus by William F. Buckley. His letter to the editor of the school newspaper, Deflating the Professor, was published. It found its way to Mr. Buckley, and the incident resulted in an invitation for him to fly to New York and be interviewed for a position with National Review magazine. In short order, our speaker joined the staff of the magazine and soon became closely associated with Mr. Buckley. Twenty-one years later, what he thought was a close friendship, in addition to being a loyal colleague and an important cog in the National Review's machine, came to a fairly abrupt halt. The loyal employee and close friend was first renounced and then cast adrift by Mr. Buckley. But our speaker had already begun writing his own syndicated newspaper column, and his reputation as a sound thinker and upholder of the U.S. Constitution had already been established. Many of you have seen his columns in the newspapers, heard him for years in the old CBS radio Spectrum series, or read his weekly column in The Wanderer, a publication for Catholics. He's the author of the book, Single Issues, Essays on the Crucial Social Questions. He now writes a monthly newsletter entitled Soberns. In great demand as a speaker, he comes to us this evening after having delivered a speech at a luncheon in Detroit earlier today. We were worried about the airlines, but they, they kept faith with us this time. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Joseph Sobern. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, very much for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the warm welcome. My fellow extremists. Uh, That's, that's what the Founding Fathers would be called, as a matter of fact, if they were here now. I asked Michael Kinsley one time, after he'd used the phrase right-wing extremist, if he would describe James Madison uh, that way, George Washington, uh, Jefferson. And he said, well, I suppose if they were still around and they still thought what they thought, then they would be considered right-wing extremists. That's the key word, I guess, considered. Um... By today's standards, of course, anyone who still believes in the same immutable truths as they believed in is an extremist. I note that uh, Bill Clinton, though he is a very modern sort of man, still has his own links with the Founding Fathers, albeit somewhat tenuous links, <laughs> Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. He... Uh, now resides, of course, in the city named for Washington. His middle name is Jefferson, and he is connected with a bank called Madison. <laughs> well, he won the election in an obvious sense. Now, there's even a sense in which I guess he deserved to win it, given the immediate alternative. <laughs> Electable Bob. Last winter, Bob Dole was admittedly not the most principled Republican, not the most consistent conservative, not the most interesting man in general. <laughs> but he had one great virtue that recommended him to the Republican Party. He was electable. Well, we've now seen just how electable he was. I wrote some months ago, before his, uh, before his little tumble in California even, I said that his campaign slogan should be, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the campaign, the supremely electable Republican had basically given up and was simply trying to 
save the Republican Congress. So he'd, he'd gone from being a Republican Party, the Republican Party presidential nominee to a sort of Republican organ donor. <laughs> and yet he came within seven or eight points of Clinton, I guess eight, nine. At any rate, uh, it wasn't the landslide everyone, including me, expected it to be. Clinton was by no means unbeatable this year. But he would have had to be beaten by someone who was the opposite of himself. Bob Dole is not the opposite of anything or anyone. <laughs> he takes pride in not being the opposite of anything. I mean, there, were, there are so many people in this country who just look at Clinton and say, whatever that is, that's the opposite of me. Bob Dole just didn't have that in him. He recognized a kind of affinity with Clinton. I, th I really think this. Who did he get angry at? He really angry at. He got angry at Pat Buchanan. He got angry at Gary Bauer and the pro-lifers. He even got angry at Steve Forbes. He couldn't get angry at Richard Nixon or Bob Packwood or Bill Clinton. These are his kind of critters. I mean, he really feels a basic affinity with them. And rightly so. I mean, he is the same type that they are. When, when scandals come out about Clinton, there's always just enough in Dole's background. He's not the worst of men, but he's a typical Washington politician. Uh, he, he just wants power and perks and things. When the scandals about foreign influence broke a couple of weeks ago, I was amazed at Clinton's audacity, and even Ross Perot jumped him. I mean, imagine coming out saying that we need more campaign finance laws as a response to that. It was as if Richard Nixon, after the Watergate break-in, had immediately called for new, tough new federal anti-burglary legislation. <laughs> <laughs> there is no cap on this man's gall, and he's... He, he's effrontery incarnate. And yet Clinton or Dole couldn't take advantage of that. He just couldn't. He is not, whatever he is the opposite of, it isn't Bill Clinton. And he doesn't, he just doesn't feel that. He knows that. It's even a part of his, whatever charm he has in a way, maybe. But the only, in fact, it was only because Dole was running against Clinton that we could be fairly sure he didn't vote for Clinton. <laughs> but it, it's true, if he weren't a politician, you could picture him back in Kansas saying, well, I'm a Republican, but this year I think I'm going to vote for Clinton. <laughs> Economy's doing pretty good, not war, why change horses in midstream? You know, that's, that's the kind of mind Bob Dole has. It's a, it's a strange accident that he got into politics as he did. It's an even stranger accident that he would be posing as the opposition to something like the liberal establishment that Clinton represents. Now, it took me a long time, probably because I spent so much of my life in orthodox conservative circles, to realize what the U.S. Constitution is. Bob Dole carried around a copy of the Tenth Amendment with him uh, all through the campaign this year. And that's to be, that's, that's a fine thing. I, I don't uh, at all disparage him for that. I only wish he'd found time to read it. <laughs> now he has time. I don't think he's going to read it. <laughs> But it was inconsistent with everything he'd ever done in his career. When he retired from the Senate, he looked back on all the bills he'd co-sponsored with various liberals, including the arch-liberal, the Massachusetts guy, of whom a friend of mine once said, my great late friend Phil Nicolaides said, Ted Kennedy is 
Ted Kennedy's religion is so private, he won't even impose it on himself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, uh, the things he was proud of were the reasons he shouldn't, shouldn't have run against Clinton. And yet, nobody in the Republican Party objected that on the basis of his record, Dole was disqualified to be the party's nominee. It's a sad thought. Not even the best of them were willing to say that. As far as they were concerned, he was conservative enough. Principled enough. I mean, Bob Dole is just unacquainted with principle. I, I hate to seem to be kicking the man when he's down and now can't get up, but he really, he's the very typical Republican in that way. He's no different from most of them. He has no conception of what the U.S. Constitution is, and most Americans unfortunately don't, especially if, like me, they went through the public school system. They aren't going to learn anything that way. I think the U.S. is now headed, at long last, for a real legitimacy crisis. I think it's going to be brought on by some kind of fiscal crash. I don't see how it's avoidable at this point unless some radical change is made in the economy and we move back toward constitutional government in a big hurry, and I see no prospect of that. I think we should keep working for it, as I'm going to argue. There's, there's a certain sense in which you might say that the real winner of this year's election was a movement spearheaded by the American Civil Liberties Union over the years. They worked long and hard to change the entire meaning of the Constitution. The name American Civil Liberties Union is a misnomer. Civil liberties, civil rights. Do you feel like me when you hear these phrases? Do you get the sinking feeling that you're actually less free when you hear that a civil rights bill has passed or that our civil liberties have been expanded by the Supreme Court. Why is that? Why is that? I think it's a question worth pondering. At, at the time of the ratification debate over the Constitution, there was one great fear, and that was that the federal government could not be confined to the powers enumerated in the Constitution. For this reason, the Bill of Rights was added, most particularly those two great amendments, the Ninth and Tenth, of which the ACLU has never heard. Well, actually, they've used the Tenth Amendment at times, or the Ninth Amendment, but never the Tenth, as far as I know. In fact, they are the mortal enemies of the Tenth Amendment, which summarizes the entire Constitution and its philosophy. Let me go into this just a bit. The... the the Ninth Amendment says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That means this Constitution is not meant to be a complete list of our God-given rights. It mentions free speech. It doesn't mention the freedom to marry. But that doesn't at all mean that the freedom to marry is not a real right or that it's not at least as important as freedom of speech. So the Constitution is saying, in effect, since our rights come from God, we can't enumerate them all in this document. The Tenth Amendment, by contrast, says the enumeration, I'm sorry, that the, the powers not delegated to the federal government, to the United States, nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, are reserved to the several states and the people. Now, that is to say because the powers of the federal government are given, delegated, that is, delegated by the people, and that's the all-important word, this Constitution is a complete list of the federal government's powers. And it's very important to note the distinction there. The Ninth Amendment tells us, both of them tell us how to read the whole Constitution. That's why these amendments are unlike any other amendments. You could call them the meta-amendments. They're the, they tell you how to interpret the rest of the document. And in that respect, they're, I think, uh, unique in the whole Constitution. But they say, 
the Constitution must not be read as an exhaustive list of our rights, but it is an exhaustive list of the, of the federal government's powers. And that's why even up to recent times, fairly recent times, at least to the 19th Amendment, uh, when the Const when in, in order to get new powers, it was acknowledged that the federal government had to get a constitutional amendment. However the Constitution was abused, that principle was at least formally honored in amendments that would say, Congress shall have power to do such and such. Notice that even prohibition required a constitutional amendment, whereas the war on drugs requires only an executive order. Quite a difference. It tells you how freely the federal government assumes powers, or as the framers would say, usurps powers never given to it. In 1940, I believe it was, the Roosevelt Pact Court, um, led by, uh, with Harlan Stone, uh, speaking for the majority, said that the Tenth Amendment merely states a truism that all the powers not surrendered are retained by the states. Notice the word surrendered. That's the language of conquest. What the Constitution says is delegated, not surrendered. When you delegate something, you can revoke it again. When you surrender something, it's gone. You've lost. The surrender, of course, is to give up once and for all. That is not the way they put it. Several states, in ratifying the Constitution, asserted their right to resume, right, that is, reclaim the powers they were delegating. In other words, the right of secession was assumed. Nobody contested this, as far as I know, at the time. It was taken for granted that the sovereign states forming a federation could withdraw from that federation. First, it was in keeping with the principle of the Declaration of Independence, that a state could declare its independence when it saw fit. Second, the federal government simply didn't have the power to stop them nor would the other states have wanted to. Of course, times changed fairly rapidly. Daniel Webster uttered the credo of a new generation when he said, liberty and union, one and inseparable, now and forever. It's the one and inseparable that I think we have to stop and uh, examine here. Inseparable, liberty and union? I don't think so. The South didn't think so. In fact, a lot of people in the North didn't think so. The first to call for secession were abolitionists. In fact, I think they were Massachusetts abolitionists who said that they didn't want to belong to a union that countenanced slavery. So they recognized the right of secession. Then, of course, it became a Southern cause and the South did secede and Lincoln who had earlier enunciated Jeffersonian principles that any people had the right to overthrow or withdraw from the existing government and set up a new one that suited them better, now had to do some fast talking to explain why the Union couldn't be dissolved under any conditions, at least not without a unanimous vote of all the states. Well, what the Civil War really settled, whatever Lincoln intended, was that nobody could secede from this union for any reason. Now, the chickens have really come home to roost on that. That means no matter how tyrannical the federal government became, no matter how many powers it usurped, no state could secede. It was the union and not our rights that turned out to be unalienable. Most notably in Roe v. Wade, that seems to me the culmination of the total consolidation of the Union, the conversion of the Union from what the Founders intended, a federation, a federal system, to, a, to what they feared and hated, a totally consolidated one, a centralized one, totally centralized, because the Supreme Court declared that all 50 states' abortion laws, even the most permissive ones, were unconstitutional. Think what that means. Not one state had ever legislated correctly on abortion. Never mind that the subject of the, was abortion here. 
Just think of the arrogance of this claim, that for the first time the Constitution has been understood rightly. That all through its history, all through their history, every single state has applied the con misapplied the Constitution on a given subject. Suppose it were traffic laws, then we'd see the absurdity of the reasoning because we wouldn't be distracted by the gravity of the subject. All 50 states had always been wrong, and no legislative minority, no previous Supreme Court justice had ever been right, because nobody had ever before suggested that these laws were in any way unconstitutional. It was assumed this was within the power of each state to decide how to regulate abortion. It was simply not a federal matter. Suddenly the Supreme Court not only said that these laws were unconstitutional, but in a sense, from another point of view, more importantly, that this was a federal matter. There is, you know the old saying, you, you, why make a federal issue of it? Well, they've literally made a federal issue of everything. No local law, no high school or grade school chewing gum rule in principle can exist except by the sufferance of the federal government now. Any of them can be declared unconstitutional. That is not federal. That is not federalism. That is total consolidation and what our ancestors would have recognized as tyranny. It doesn't matter how small the subject. It doesn't have to be big and bloody to be tyranny. It can be tyranny even if it's a very minor matter because a principle is at stake. Do we, the people, have the right to govern ourselves? A distinguished liberal constitutional scholar praised Earl Warren once. He said that Earl Warren understood that what really mattered was not what the Constitution said, but what the court had said in 400 volumes of commentary. Think about that. That means that every Supreme Court decision supersedes the Constitution as written. It's not we the people, it's we the lawyers. That's who decides the meaning of the Constitution. Not by reasoning, not as Hamilton said, because their only, their only uh, power is in reason, but because they can declare it and make it stick. If the states have the right to secede, if the states still have the effective right to secede, the court, I submit, would never have dared to impose Roe v. Wade, which doesn't even hold water as jurisprudence. There are a lot of legal scholars, liberals, pro-abortion, pro-consolidation, who say that Roe v. Wade is simply terrible legal reasoning. It doesn't matter how terrible it is. The court can make it stick. Now, we've forgotten Thomas Jefferson's warning in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. He said the federal government must never be allowed to be the judge of the extent of its own powers. Defeats the whole purpose of the Constitution. But that's exactly what we do routinely now. We wait for the federal government to tell us what the Constitution means. They're supposedly our servants. It's as if we gave our servants their orders. Said, here are your powers. And they took them and said, say, how about if we read this over and tell you what it means? And we agreed to it. And then they told us, well, it means that we can do whatever we want to do, and you can do whatever we let you do. Well, who would be the master and who would be the servant if you accepted that arrangement? That's basically what the American people have done now basically out of ignorance and miseducation, and to a great extent out of greed, because a lot of people want to live off other people, and through a consolidated government uninhibited by the Constitution, they can do it. I recently wrote a column that got a sharp rejoinder in the Philadelphia Inquirer. I said that nobody who gets money from the government should be allowed to vote. Oh. That's... Thank you. That, that wasn't original with me, just that nobody had said it lately, within earshot of most people. people you know, pe a lot of people realize this, but they're afraid to say it. 
It flies against the current notions of democracy. But one of the great champions of democracy, John Stuart Mill, added the provision that, of course, nobody who doesn't pay taxes or who receives money from the government should be allowed to vote. Otherwise, you're, if you do that, you're inviting people to plunge their hands into their neighbor's pockets. Well, that's a total corruption of democracy. And look at now, what is the problem here in this democracy? It's that the entitlements, the direct income payments of Social Security and Medicare form such a huge part of the budget and such an untouchable part that the, it, they threaten to plunge the U.S. government into bankruptcy. There it is. It's right there. It's as obvious as it can be. Even the most honorable politicians are afraid to touch these things. But they're unconstitutional. Now, how did this come about? Well, the, as I say, the federal, first of all, the, the, the two great mechanisms are judicial review and the principle of, that the Civil War established. Non-secession, that is, the states have to take whatever is dished out by the federal government, and the principle that the federal government decides what the Constitution means. Now, the whole idea of the Constitution was to restrict the federal government, to give it its guidelines. Now the federal government is seen by everybody who, is, who hasn't really stopped to think about it as the enforcer of the Constitution the enforcer of civil rights and civil liberties rather than the respecter. It should be the humble servant. It's not. It's an arrogant intruder. We all know this. You know, I, I, I love it when pro-abortion liberals say, you know, we've got to keep government out of the bedroom. That's the only room they want the government out of. <laughs> it's like saying, it's, it's like... Uh, uh, defending can cannibalism, saying, let's keep the government out of the kitchen. Uh, in fact, I was thinking during the second debate that if Bill Clinton had come out for cannibalism and had to defend his record, he'd say, we must defend our precious dietary freedoms against those who would tell us what we may and may not feed our children. <laughs> we must keep government out of the kitchen. And Bob Dole would say defensively, Bob Dole has never tried to tell anyone what they could eat. <laughs> That's the level of discourse this country has sunk to. Now, without reviewing the whole business, and I, I'm trying to write a little book about it when I find time, the, there are two, two clauses of the Constitution that have especially been abused, as many of you know. One is the Commerce Clause. Federal government has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, it's not even the Commerce Clause. It's one part, one third of the Commerce Clause that has been stretched. Well, the other two haven't, interestingly enough. I, I compare the Court's interpretation of the Constitution to an accordion. It expands what it likes and compresses what it doesn't like. So it's expanded the Commerce Clause to mean the federal government has the power to regulate everything. Your child's Kool-Aid stand could be interstate commerce. That's quite literally true. In fact, there's a better case for that than for some things the court has called interstate commerce. For example, it, it's ruled in a famous 1942 case that the uh, a farmer growing grain on his own land to feed his own livestock is engaged in interstate commerce within the meaning of the, of the clause. Well, that, that doesn't leave anything the federal government can't touch. So... so it's, a, it's an absurd reading, and it, it allows the federal government simply to usurp any power whatsoever. In fact, it was quite shocking to liberals this year when Clarence Thomas wrote an opinion saying there were limits on the Tenth Amendment, on the, uh, on the Commerce Clause. And he actually reasserted the Tenth Amendment. Linda Greenhouse of the New York Times wrote that the Supreme Court had come within one vote of reestablishing the Articles of Confederation which is the New York Times nickname for the Constitution. 
the real Constitution. And, of course, the other one is the 14th Amendment. This has turned into another gigantic loophole. The, the court uses a few phrases in the 14th Amendment to give itself the power to strike down any state or local law whatsoever. And that is, in a nutshell, how we got this complete consolidation. Now, the American Civil Liberties Union, as I've mentioned, has never been a friend of the Tenth Amendment. It has been the friend of consolidation, but it uses liberties as the mask for consolidation. It uses a distorted conception of individual rights to invite the federal government into every state and locality to knock down its laws. So the, under the guise of defending the individual, the ACLU, followed by liberal opinion in general, has turned the Supreme Court into the great agent of consolidation and centralization, just the opposite of what judicial review was supposed to be. Judicial review was supposed to mean the court acting as a check on the legislative branch of, gov of the federal government, on Congress. So when Congress usurped power, the court would be there to say, oh, no, you don't. Instead, the court has allowed the Congress to usurp all the powers it desires, while accusing the states of usurping powers, even powers they exercise throughout their entire existence and whose constitutionality had never, ever, 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 ever been questioned. It's so absurd it could only be done by raw power. People couldn't have been reasoned into it. And as I say, if there'd been any effective method of counteracting it, it would, this would have been counteracted. If states had been able to secede or if they'd had any mechanism, any real checks on the court itself, this couldn't have happened. But the state legislatures have no check on the federal judiciary. It's that simple. It's a simple matter of power. And the courts have used their raw power in accordance with the prevailing ideology of the 20th century, which has many names, fascism, communism, liberalism, moderate republicanism. <laughs> all these things, all these things are centralizing. Bob Dole has spent most of his career helping to centralize power, and he doesn't even know it. I don't think he believes in the Tenth Amendment at all, but I think he believes he believes in it. <laughs> I think, in a, you know, in his daft way, he was sincere when he would hold that thing up and say, I believe in this. But the, the ACLU began its career during World War I as a leftist organization. It defended the rights, basically the rights of dissent and subversion of the left. And I, I won't say it was wrong in every case. I think it probably did some good. You know, a stop clock is right twice a day, and I'm willing to grant that. <laughs> but its motivation was never to protect the Bill of Rights. If you understand the Bill of Rights as a set of restraints on the federal government, the ACLU is about the worst enemy the Bill of Rights ever had. And I'll, the, the proof is quite simple. Roger Baldwin was an outright Soviet not sympathizer, enthusiast. He went to the Soviet Union in 1927, according to his sympathetic biographer, and said to a Moscow audience, you don't need a civil liberties union here. You already have the working class in charge. What would you need a civil liberties union for? And that was not a single aberration at all. That was the consistent policy of the ACLU. Communists Communist leaders, American Communist Party officials like William Z. Foster and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn were on the national board of the ACLU. They'll tell you, yes, but we also represent the, we've also represented Klansmen and Nazis and so forth. Sure, they did. They represented them in court, but they never put them on their national board. <laughs> they just found it convenient to use them so they could make it appear they were defending everyone's rights impartially with this false universalism that's so typical of the left, typical of frauds in general. They always pre pretend to be standing for a general principle. Well, the ACLU, nevertheless, has very gradually and with tremendous success changed the general understanding 
of the U.S. Constitution among the American people, and most of all among the educated elites. I mean, it's the more educated people are, the more likely they are to succumb to that reading of the Constitution, the centralizing reading, the idea that the Constitution is, as they say, a living document. Try telling your banker you regard your mortgage as a living document, your mortgage contract, <laughs> that, you know, words change their meaning according to circumstances, and especially numerals, and that your, you think your payment should evolve into a lower monthly <laughs> settlement. And again, just in terms of contract law, what kind of contract is it that one side interprets to its own advantage and one side enforces against the other, and which the other side has no means of enforcing? That's what we have. The states and the people have no way of enforcing the Constitution against the federal government. It has a monopoly of interpretation, which is the greatest absurdity there could be. If there were to be a monopoly of interpreting the Constitution, it should belong to anyone except the federal government, which it's supposed to restrain. Now, I would say that the ACLU's success, and it's not only the ACLU, but it's largely, you know, the ACLU has, has, a, has been the brains of the outfit and can stand as a symbol for the rest. This is the greatest feat of intellectual ledger domain in American history, to convince us that our Constitution has actually evolved into a charter for centralized government. It's evolved not only into something different from what it used to mean, which is understandable, but into the very opposite of its original principle. It cannot be. It can't possibly be. It just doesn't stand up to common sense. Well, I think this is, this sets the agenda for us. The, I mean, the, the practical meaning of this is that entitlements now under the ACO reading, ACLU reading, entitlements are constitutional and they're wrecking the country. But we can vote about that. The Constitution decides what you can and can't vote about. And here's how they've inverted the meaning. Unconstitutional entitlements, which should not be within the power of Congress to enact, are enacted. In fact, they're almost unremovable. Again, just the very opposite of the way it should be. Meanwhile, we the people are not allowed to vote at the local, state and local level to protect unborn children from the abortionist knife. Now, what difference does it make who wins an election when the terms of the election are set in advance? And that's why I say the ACLU has really won this election and the last few elections in advance because the opposition doesn't even know it's, it subscribes to an alien doctrine, to a doctrine inimical to the real obvious meaning of the Constitution, not just the original meaning, but the meaning right there on the page, the inescapable logical meaning of the Constitution. It, that thing cannot mean what they say it means. It's not that words have changed in their meanings. It's that certain passages have been dropped out completely. It's a defeat. It's a defeat for the whole Constitution when the courts usurp the power of the people, the right of the people, to govern their own lives, their own states, to set the moral tone in their own communities. I don't say everything they do is right, but I say the federal government has nothing to say about it. That's why, you know, I, I, I guess we all feel such a horrible sense of defeat when somebody like Dole is nominated for the Republican Party. Not that I believe in the Republican Party as our salvation, but I wish somebody would put up a little bit of a fight about these things. The idea that so, the Republican view that somebody electable should be nominated really is tremendously wrong-headed. And I'll tell you why. You already know why, but the way I would explain it is this.
it's much more up important to uphold a standard than for that standard to win every time out, or than for a party to win every time out. If Dole had won, what would we have won? Would you feel you had won anything? You wouldn't have. But if somebody else had, had run in his place, had run as the Republican leader, no matter how badly he was drunk, drubbed on the election day, if he lost by 50 points, but he was still upholding the Constitution, at least the American people would know there was an alternative conception of the Constitution. They don't even know it now. That's the tragedy of it. I'm a Catholic. I saw a headline in the Detroit paper this morning that the Catholic hierarchy now faces more dissent. We're, we used to call it heresy. If you don't believe this, look, there's a nice Unitarian church down the street. Why don't you try that one? Now, if you can't believe what the church teaches, you don't belong here. It's not a democracy. The important things are never settled by majority vote. Majority vote is good for deciding who is going to fill an office. It cannot give you a philosophy. The principles of the Constitution decide what the state can and cannot do. Elections are only to decide who's going to do them, who's competent to do them. Now, the Constitution defines what the majority can decide one way. The ACLU Constitution decides it another way. But the idea of dissent in the church as a right, you know, the average American Catholic understands his church so badly now that he thinks of the church itself on this ACLU model. Free speech as a right within the church. It's not. It can't be. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, if you work at General Motors, especially if you're on the board, you don't have a right to advocate for it. These are rights that are supposed to inhibit the federal government and the federal government only. And so because of the perennial election outcome, I mean, we've had Dole, Ford, uh, and uh, Nixon, and Bush, and Reagan, uh, the, the illusion of Reagan. I used to say, let Reagan be Reagan. Finally, I said, let somebody else be Reagan. <laughs> What scares me is I'm afraid they're going to let Kemp be Reagan. <laughs> but, I mean, this, you, you see the tremendous success the other side has had, not only in giving its standard the upper hand, but in obliterating the memory of any other standard. That's where we come in. That's what has to be done. And the John Birch Society is the perfect institution to do it because you do understand the Constitution. But I wonder if you understand how important it is. And I say this not because I think you don't understand it, but because, as Samuel Johnson said, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be informed. But just always keep in mind, the most important thing is for ordinary Americans to know what the Founding Fathers stood for and that it was not the same thing they're taught every day, not just by the ACLU, which has already faded away into the background and has already really completed its mission, but by the media and the schools and the corrupt law schools, by everything around us. I mean, people don't know there's any alter. You don't need a conspiracy when you've got a consensus like this. The conspiracy has done its work. Now it's time for us to conspire, to conspire and tell the truth. And I would say, if, if you're not paranoid nowadays, you must be nuts. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're everywhere. I mean, you hear this stuff, you know how it is. You hear it from your own family. They're all pod people now. They're all regurgitating. What, uh, what has been fed into their brains all their lives. You turn on the TV, you hear the same thing by people who literally don't know any better. And I'll close with a story I just love, told by my friend, the great literary critic Hugh Kenner. Um, 
who once asked the museum curator how they discovered that a certain statue at the Metropolitan Museum of Art was a forgery. It was supposedly an ancient Etruscan horse. Uh, it was a horse, but supposedly from ancient Etruria. And, and the curator said, well, we carbon dated it. He said, I understand that, but why were you suspicious enough to carbon date it? And she said, well, that's an interesting story. See, whoever made that horse in the 19th century gave it every ancient Etruscan mannerism that he could see. But he also gave it every 19th century mannerism that he couldn't see. He didn't realize he was giving it the style of his own time, but neither did anyone else because, as she put it, the style of your own time is always invisible. So in the 20th century, suddenly the 19th century features of that horse, well, gradually the 19th century features of that horse ascended into visibility, and somebody looked at it and said, that looks awfully 19th century. We better test it, and they did. So as, as Hugh says, the style of your own time is always invisible. Most people don't realize the extent to which they're conforming, rather than making up their own minds and using their own reason. It's a real feat to make up your own mind. In fact, I would add a corollary to Hugh's adage. I'd say, the style of your own time is always invisible unless you could manage to remain behind the times. <laughs> and that's our task, to remain behind the times, to turn back the clock, to make people realize that the eternal truths, some of the eternal truths, were enunciated a long time ago, and they're not outdated, and they're not going to evolve into something else. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs>